Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, to whom is the glory forever. days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of free people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of. Him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this man, woman was a widow of about eighty-four years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord, and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. Glory be to God forever. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Many happy returns. Today is the Feast of Circumcision, where we celebrate the circumcision of Christ. And some people might wonder, why is it that we celebrate the circumcision of Christ? This is actually showing us how Christ fulfilled the law. Because in the law of the Old Testament is that circumcision was necessary in order to be considered among the people of God. And in the New Testament, this was replaced by the sacrament of baptism. So circumcision, which is something that was done to young children, is now replaced by baptism, which is also done to young children, as the true sign of being the, the children of God. And so we celebrate the baptism of Christ, and then later on, on this Thursday, actually, we celebrate the baptism of Christ. So we look at how Christ is the one who fulfilled the law, and that how all of the symbols that were in the Old Testament were fulfilled by Christ, and they were pointing to the true sacrament in the, in the New Testament, which, which gives life. So today we read uh, this story about how Christ's parents, they brought him into the temple to be circumcised. And we meet this lady, her name is Anna, the prophetess, who has spent most of her life living in the temple. And we read about her in verses 37 and 38. And it says, Who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And so I want to talk about a little bit about this, this 
woman and what is it that we know about her and specifically something that occurs in my mind when I when I read about her story is that she was a widow from a young age uh, she she was married for seven years to her husband and then she remained a widow uh, now 84 84 years and during this time she remained in the temple and she served God and it, we have to think um, sometimes when people are either widowed or single for a long period of time what is it that they're going to do with their life Sometimes people who are single and want to be married and cannot find a spouse uh, or maybe those who are widowed from a young age and um, they, they want to remarry and they can't find someone. There's a sense of loneliness and the sense of wanting companionship that is unfulfilled for perhaps a very long time. But this woman gives us an example of how is it that we can use our time while we are single, while we are not yet married while we are not in any kind of relationship instead of simply only being in despair that we are alone there's something that we can do in order for us to be serving God during the time that we have when we are single we read about her actually that she did not depart from the temple uh, it says uh, in verse 37 who did not depart from the temple this points to us that while we are single, we should be focusing on our service, our service in the church. We read in 1 Peter chapter 4, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Each one of us has been given a gift by God. Each, each one of us has been given by God something that he wants us to use for the betterment and the edification of those around us and of the church. So one thing that we can do with the time that we have when we are single is instead of just wasting it instead of just using it for just you know our entertainment or our pleasure we can consecrate some of this time for service service in the church and being involved in the church and this is one thing we learned from her actually she went to to you know the maximum extent where she actually lived in the temple and her entire life was consecrated to the service but short of doing this and i'm not asking that we were to do this but that we would have time that we dedicate to God. And this time is very valuable because as we get older and as we are married and have a relationship and kids and all these things, we have much less time. And a lot of times the seeds that we sow uh, in our spiritual life at the very beginning of our life is what we will reap later on. Those people who um, sow the seeds of their spiritual life and of spiritual education and coming to the church and learning, they will learn deeper than those who um, put this off for many, many, many years and only begin this process at an older age because they will have the time, they will have the energy, they will have the memory, they will have so much that they can invest when they are younger um, that then they will carry, carry it through to when they are older. So one thing we learn from her is use the time. Use the time wisely as a single person and, and like, she said, like, like it says about her, she did not depart from the temple. Also, we should also be involved in the church and always be in the church serving God. It also says about her that she served God with fastings, which points to us to her self-control. It points to us to her self-control. Again, one thing that people struggle with uh, being single is struggling with lusts or struggling with the idea of self-control, of, of being in this state that I'm in. Maybe when I see other people around me are in relationships or getting married or whatever the case is, and I feel like I am not. And it's easy for us to fall into different kinds of temptations as single people um, because of this, this status. And especially in our society where relationships and sexuality and these things are um, exalted to such a level where we are almost made to feel like if I am not in some kind of relationship and even a physical relationship, that there's something wrong with me, that there's something missing in my life, or that somehow this is like the pinnacle of, of pleasure and joy is to be just the fact that I'm in a relationship. So we see actually about her that she served God with fasting. Okay, She served God with fasting and this self-control. In Proverbs 25, verse 28, it says, Whoever has no rule over his own spirit it is like a city broken down without walls. The city broken down without walls. It's like if I am not in, in control of myself, then I'm like a city with no walls so that whatever enemy comes against me, I'm immediately destroyed by them. Whatever temptation immediately comes upon me when I'm in this state of no self-control, 
I will immediately succumb to it. I will immediately fall. I will, I will immediately be destroyed by whatever temptation comes, like these enemies coming to a city that has no defenses whatsoever. And so this is why we focus in the church so much on self-control. And one of the ways that we do that is through fasting. And, and that's what she's doing here, Anna the prophetess. She is serving God with fastings because this is what's going to help her to maintain her self-control. It is very, very difficult for a woman or for a man to live in this state of being um, consecrated to God as a single person all throughout their entire life. Okay, So that's why we, we can't just leave things as they are. We have to focus. We have to live with some kind of a purpose and some kind of a plan of how is it that I'm going to keep myself from lust? How is it that I'm going to keep myself from temptation for an entire lifetime? Okay, and this is what she's doing. She's serving God with fasting. So we focus on fasting as well. Fasting helps us to maintain our self-control. It helps me to be self-controlled in what is it that I do? What is it that I say? What is it that I think? What is it that I allow myself to see? Who is it that I spend my time with? All these things are related to self-control. Also, it says about her that she served God with prayers. Okay? Actually, prayer is a perfect uh, solution to loneliness because prayer is a conversation with a person. You know, when we say that we are lonely, it means that we are lonely because we are alone and we have no one to talk with, we have no one to be with, we have no one to share our life with. And yet, what is prayer? Prayer is sharing our life. Prayer is talking to someone. Prayer is, is sharing our feelings and sharing our thoughts and talking to a person. And not just any person, but a person who is always present and a person who can understand me better than I can understand myself. A person who is not going to condemn me, is not going to gossip against me, is not going to judge me, but someone who is simply going to hear me and accept from me what is it that I feel, what is it that I think, and then can even forgive me my sins when I offer repentance to him. In Psalm 130, it says, Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. This is why when we speak to God, we should be speaking to him from what is in our hearts. We should be speaking to him about the depth of who I am. And so instead of, you know, when I feel these feelings of loneliness, I should direct this feeling to God himself. Who, who, God is present. God is with me. Whenever I have a feeling of loneliness, I direct this to God and I speak to him about the way that I feel. And God can grant me comfort. And God can be my companion. This is why often uh, during... Um, like the young, the young years or the youthful years of people's lives, again, because they have time and they're less distracted by responsibility, they can go very deep in their relationship with God if, if they choose, because they, they can focus, they have the time to focus, they have the energy to focus, they have less responsibility to be just distracted by things in the world, and so if they want to go deeper in their relationship with God through fasting, through prayers, they can. And this is why we shouldn't be wasting this time. For all people who are young, especially those who are single, use this time. Use this time wisely and approach God and draw near to Him. The other thing we read about her is when it said, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day, meaning she persevered all throughout her life. It's easy for us, especially when we're motivated by something a sermon or an example of a person that we admire or something that we say, you know what, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be this person. And we imagine ourselves being this, you know, very spiritual, holy, righteous person. And we want to do this and we're going to do it. And it lasts for like one week. And then after that week is done, we can't do it anymore. And it's too, it's too hard. And we feel like we can't, we can't continue to do this. And we find ourselves slipping back into what it is that we've always done again. But the idea of perseverance is necessary because if we are going to give up after failing uh, after that first week, okay, then we are not going to lose the blessing of the struggle. This is actually expected. It's expected that we fail. So, so when we fail, what is it that we do? We should get up again. Uh, in, in Philippians 4, 6, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. We continue to make our requests known to God all the time. Or make our requests known to Him all the time. We keep fighting all the time. We keep speaking to Him all the time. We're always um, struggling to reach the goal. And I'm sure even in the life of someone like Anna the prophetess, not every day was good. Not every day was 
was was was what she hoped it to be just as us so especially for someone who is single who goes through ups and downs of feeling loneliness and and, and feeling confusion and not knowing what to do with their life um, it's easy for us to lose heart but it's important that we continue in our struggle night and day that we stay focused on what it is that we're doing and we don't get lost in the world and get lost with all the temptations and the lust that are in it because of her faithfulness and because of her perseverance and because of her discipline and then she was rewarded right she was rewarded by seeing christ himself while still alive and this reward is something that we should be looking always to why is it that we're doing this why is it that we're struggling why is it that we're denying ourselves things that we want it's because we expect a greater reward from god we expect a greater reward a far greater reward and so we always have our eyes on the prize we always have our eyes on what is it that I'm trying to achieve and why. I want to be with God. I want to benefit from Him. I want to experience the joys of being with Him. I want to be rewarded by Him. In Colossians 3.24, it says, Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. So if in our lives God has not yet allowed us to be in a permanent relationship, or maybe that we did, we're in one, but we're now widowed, and we feel lonely again god is going to reward me in some way if i focus on him if i struggle toward him then we will receive our reward from him another aspect of what we should do when we're in this status is we should always be thankful always thanking god for the good whenever we're in a difficult situation it's easy to focus on the negative things and to forget the good things and when we focus on the negative things we imagine to feel like our life is just black around us everything is black and dull and gloomy and painful and and we look at the other people around us and we think that they are the opposite their lives are great and wonderful and we wish that we were like them and we always look at those around us and think that their lives are better than ours but the moment we really stop and consider all of the good and amazing things that God has done in our lives, even though there are some things maybe that we wish he would have done that hasn't been done, we begin to see things in a different way. In Psalm 107, it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. We should try as hard as we can to be, always be thankful to when we wake up in the morning, we remember God's mercies. We remember the good things, the things that we've taken for granted because maybe they're with us all the time the people that are are in our lives you know maybe we're lonely in one way but there's always other people there's always other people that god has placed in our lives to fill gaps and to make us feel like we are not completely and utterly alone other things that god has given always be thankful for these things we see actually about her in the last part of the verse i'm going to read it again um it says, and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. What was her response? This, this old woman who lived in the temple her entire life, who was fasting and prayer, praying night and day, that when she saw Christ, she thanked God. And then it says, she spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So this sacred moment that she experienced, she did not keep it to herself, but she went and she shared it with others. It reminds us actually of the story also of the Samaritan woman who she was also in a state of loneliness. She was also in a state of isolation. And yet when she met with Christ, it says about her, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. So these people who have this sacred moment of being close to God and experiencing God, they can teach others through their experience. They can teach others what it is that they have learned. So someone who maybe is experiencing loneliness and is able to uh, experience the love of God, the companionship of God, is then able to share that experience with other people and teach them, this is how I experienced God in my loneliness. This is how I saw him. This is how I was able to speak with him. This is how I felt from him, how much he loved me, even in that moment of loneliness. This is a, a great blessing, actually. Because sometimes when we have so many relationships and people around us, we begin to forget that God is there. We begin to forget the amount of love and care and compassion that I can experience from God alone. Because I feel it so much from other people. But when I am truly alone, and when I truly have no one else, and I'm almost forced to look at God and speak with Him, I experience a love from Him and a kindness from Him that maybe I could have never experienced otherwise. So there's always good. 
there's always good that can be found even in times of loneliness. Actually, this is one of the reasons that monks go into solitude. One of the reasons that they go into solitude is because they experience God more real, in a, in a more real way, in a more deep way. They're in solitude because there's no other distraction, there's no other people. So maybe loneliness that, that we experience, this is something we wish we didn't experience, but there is something good that can come from it. We can experience God in a, in a more real way. The last point I'm going to speak about is that she was focused on redemption. Okay, She focused her entire life on repentance and eternity. So even d during this whole time that she's staying in the, in the temple, why is she doing this? She's not sitting there to lament her, her, her problems. She's not staying, staying there to say that um, you know her life is horrible or she's staying in the temple because she has nowhere else that she can go. She enjoys this life because she sees that this life that she's living now is leading her to the next life. And again, if we consider what is rea the reality of life, that the eternal life is the true life, and that the life we live here is only a temporary one, then we we'll realize that this, her approach is actually what we should all be doing. We should all be consecrating ourselves in this way, because the life that we have here, and the success that we have here, and the relationships that we have here, and everything that we have here is going to go away. Is going to go away. The only relationship in my life that does not pass away, that does not fizzle out, that does not end, is actually the relationship between me and God. This is the only relationship that will remain. Uh, even, even Christ, when he's speaking to the Pharisees, he makes it clear that people who are married do not remain married in heaven. Right. So even if we consider ourselves, those of us who are married, that the closest person to me actually is my spouse, what will happen after we are in heaven? that this person who is my spouse is no longer the closest person to me. So God is actually the closest person to me. Even now, while we are married, God should be the closest one to us. And through our relationship with God, all other relationships are defined. How is it that I love my spouse to, into the highest degree I can? It's because I have a love for God. It's because, I des because through God, I love everyone. So the, 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 the main focus, the main relationship that anyone has, even those who are married, is God. And that through God, I can love my husband or I can love my wife. It's not the other way around. It's not that I can just directly love my husband and wife. Actually, my husband and wife will not even be my husband and wife in, in, in eternity. So, so it's just something for us to think about. She here, she focused on eternity. She focused on her redemption. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, it says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. The work of God is mysterious. He has put eternity in our hearts in the sense that we have a desire for God. We have a desire to be in heaven and to be with Him. And, and it's, but it's a mystery. It's a mystery to us. So when we are alone, we have to remember that we are not really alone. That God is always with us and, and He loves us and has compassion on us. So in summary, there's a few points that we can learn here from Anna the prophetess. One, she did not depart from the temple. So we also should be involved in the church and filling our times with useful things. Two, she served God with fastings. She focused on her self-discipline. We also, especially in times of temptation, like when we are feeling lonely, we should be disciplined in our use of our time so that we do not fall into sin. Also, she served God with prayers. If we are wanting to talk to someone and we feel alone, God is always present. We can learn to talk with Him and feel His companionship and His care for us. Also, she, she continued serving Him night and day, unceasingly. She did not give up. She persevered to the end. She was rewarded by God because of her struggle, because she did not give in to temptation, because she remained in the temple, and He, he rewarded her by allowing her to see Him. She was thankful, and she thanked God for the reward that he gave her and for the life that she had led. And then in her experience, she shared her faith with other people and she focused in her entire life on redemption and her eternity. And this is all that we also should be doing, whether it be in times that we are feeling lonely and alone or, or in any situation, we should always be focusing on God. And glory be to God forever. Amen.